starting. Uh, good morning, dear colleagues, dear friends. As we all see, it turns to be a more academic uh, symposium today, since the presenters in the audience is the same group, <laughs> actually. But anyway, yeah. Uh, we hope that uh, friends and colleagues are uh, following us through the um, live streaming. Um, I would like to say a few words uh, trying to sum up a bit uh, regarding yesterday and uh, some make some clarifications, which for us are more or less known, but uh, I think it's uh, needed to be done. Um, so. Uh, First of all, uh, Angeliki uh, yesterday tried to make uh, some notes uh, regarding um, the spirituality of Islam, Tazavuf, etc. So it's uh, necessary for all the people who deal with uh, Bektasism to know that there is a very important uh, part of um, uh, Sufi philosophy in this. Since a big part of the Bektasis are a, a tarikat. Uh, I don't know if we can characterize all the Alevi Bektasi community uh, as a tarikat. But we have to have in mind that we have Tazavuv uh, at the back, which is uh, an approach, a philosophy, a philosophical approach, which has certain uh, implementations in the everyday life. <coughs> Uh, Tazavuf actually is, uh, started as an attempt of some certain people who have some center, uh, certain uh, worries uh, in order to communicate with God. So it was an um, alternative and deeper, let's say, uh, approach to the typical religion. I think uh, for the time being this is enough. The second is that when we talk about Bektasism, we don't, uh, Alevism, Bektasism, actually we are uh, talking about two separate things we are, which uh, are joined in some points. Actually, in the Alevism, Bektasism, we have two big branches. The Babagyan branch, which are the sons and the grandsons of Haji Bektas, but spiritual grands and gr uh, sons and grandsons. And the Celebi branch, which are the bloodline of uh, the... Uh, considered to be bloodline of uh, Haji Bektashi Veli. Yesterday we had the representatives of the uh, Pirevi from the Ulusoi family, who are the, the people who keep the um, silsila, the lineage of the bloodline. But at the same time, there are the Bektashis who are um, the Babagyan branch, who are, who are the spiritual sons of uh, Haji Bektashi Veli. At that part, we find the Tazavuf and the Tarikat. Nowadays, only a few people can, be na can name themselves as Bektasis of this type. Out of Albania, of course, because in Albania the situation is different. Is, uh, the the Bektasis there is, a, in a way, an official religion. But in my understanding, not in the depth of the... Um, anyway, in the depth. <laughs> I would accept, expect to be. Uh, so we have two different things, uh, uh, common main principles, but different uh, behaviors. All the tekes we refer uh, were connected to the Babagyan branch. And I will show you later uh, more and more elements regarding the tekes in Greece. The people who were yesterday here are actually from the Alevi branch. There is a difference in my understanding the Babagyan branch is an elaborated thing, let's say uh, scholar, while at the same time the Alevi branch is a um, rural approach, which carries more um, elements regarding the everyday rural life, while the Babagyan branch has a certain, certain um, uh, how is it, typ typ typical behavior. Actually, for the people who, are, who have some kind of familiarization with uh, Christianity, the Babagan branch uh, and the Tekes look like a monastery as the, uh, having, uh, regarding the structure. Anyway, so these are two clarifications. Um, we are at your disposal, at our disposal, as it seems, we are at our disposal to discuss such things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? 
Uh, I welcome you again, and uh, now the floor is to the for the Evangelist and the Minister Pan. Thank you very much, Yorgos. Uh, first of all, I would kindly ask you all to uh, put your uh, mobile phones on silent mode. Σας παρακαλώ αν είναι εύκολο να κλείσετε τα κινητά σας. So now uh, we go to the second panel of the symposium, which is a, a very fascinating uh, issue of uh, the relationship between the state and Alevi's Bektasism, uh, which is one of the most uh, important uh, dynamic through the ages that continues until today. So I'll give the floor to uh, Mrs. Uh, Yula Yilmaz, who will talk to us about the connections uh, between the uh, Bektashis and the Janissary Corps. Thank you very much. Okay, you hear me? Um, Today I will be presenting on the intriguing relationship uh, between uh, Bektashism and the Janissary Army. And uh, the focus will be on Istanbul and from, uh, let's say, the beginning of the uh, Janissary Army until uh, 1826 uh, that the army, Janissary Army was abolished. Uh, delving into this topic uh, poses significant challenges due to the scarcity of archives that provide information on Bektashi communities, as well as the functioning and structure of Bektashi lodges. Also, the Ottoman archives are notably deficient in documentation related to the Janissary army, with many records deliberately destroyed during the abolition of the Janissaries in 1826. During this time, several Bektashi lodges were either closed, demolished, transformed into Naqshbandi lodges or subjected to stricter control along with the abolition of the army. The silenced Bektashi communities, coupled with the intentional destruction of records, uh, has made this topic even more challenging. This multidimensional silence underscores the need for a more meticulous examination of historical archives sometimes requiring historians to connect the dots with their insights. Historians are accustomed to dealing with silent groups and elusive archives, but my personal experience recently disclosed the ex ex extent of the silence. I recently discovered that my uh, maternal grandparents who immigrated to Turkey from Bulgaria in the 1930s were followers of Demirboba Lodge in Silistre and unfortunately this tradition did not survive uh, their migration and was not passed down to future generations. And this actually, for me, highlights the depth of the silence was out of my grasp. In the light of these challenges, uh, today I will begin discussing the possible emotional and mental uh, influence, <coughs> excuse me, uh, mental influence of Bektashi beliefs on the formation of the early modern Janissary arm, uh, Janissary warriors. Uh, then I will examine the presence of uh, Bektashi Janissaries in Istanbul, uh, especially with the urbanization of the uh, soldiers in the 17th century. And finally, I will take a brief look at the possible connection of Janissaries and the Bektashi lodges uh, in general. Uh, opinions differ on when uh, the close relationship between the Bektashi sect and the Janissary army began. Haji Bektash died long before the foundation of the Ottoman state, and uh, therefore it's unlikely that uh, he was present during the foundation of the army. Some scholars date uh, this close relationship to the period uh, when the Janissary army was founded, others uh, to the beginning of the 15th centuries, or uh, some scholars to the end of the 16th century. So uh, even the uh, origins of the relationship is not very clearly known. Um, Janissaries were predominantly recruited during their adolescence, became first Ajimi Olans, and then entered to the Janissary regiments <coughs> uh, within the early structure of the army. Uh, during this passage, the young boys who entered the warrior organization 
uh, were transformed by strong codes of brotherhood, martial prowess, and discipline got integrated into a strict hierarchical operation and interrelated belief system, Bektashism, that set the tone of ceremonies, rituals, and notions of fighting for a religion and possible martyrdom. It is important to mention that not all Janissaries were followers of the Bektashi sect, whereas the codes and figures of mystical Islam in general, I forgot to, uh, okay. Um, Sorry, uh, the codes uh, and figures of mystical Islam in general, which also had important roles in Bektashism, were crucial in building uh, a Janissary identity. The spiritual leader of the Janissary army was ex expected to be, uh, uh, accepted to be Haji Bektash Veli, and the Janissaries in the, uh, in the accounts were referred uh, as uh, Zümri Bektashiyan, Bektashi oğulları, Hacı Bektaş Köçekleri uh, and uh, other synonyms like that. The 94th Regiment of the Army, Hukeşan, were Bektaşi dervishes responsible for praying day and night for the victory of the army and praying at ceremonies. Uh, Gübangs uh, were part of the Janissary ceremonies and recited before going on campaigns and or, or during assaults. In searching for the connection between the uh, Janissaries and Bek Bektashis, I examined the works of uh, Bektashi Janissary poets as they were an important part of the folk literature in the 16th and 17th centuries. These poets' works, who, uh, works also were sung in the barracks, on the battlefields, and in fortresses in the 15th and 16th centuries, and had influence on soldiers. Uh, symbolic elements of the Bektashi prayers were present in these poems. They uh, generally mention the Prophet Muhammad, uh, Prophet Ali, the 12 Imams, and the forces of supernatural world referred to as Üçler, Beşler, Yediler, Kırklar. Uh, the Prophet Ali was the most uh, important figure representing martyrdom and bravery. Uh, often described with his uh, sword, Zülfikar, and uh, his horse called Düldül. For example, um, Çırpanlı uh, declares in his verses that their leader saint was Hacı Bektaş. He was one of the few soldier, uh, soldier poets in the 16th century whose poems have survived to this day. He served under Murat Reis in Algiers uh, and the Mediterranean is accepted to have been a Devşirme recruit from uh, Çırpan in Filibe uh, by literary historians. Another poet, Armutlu, uh, who also served under Murat Reis, uh, in one of his few surviving poems said, those were the days the Prophet Ali wrote Düldül, indicating that it was time for war, and wrote in his verses that Imam Hüseyin Hasan uh, was marched in Karbela. Another figure, uh, Mansur el Halaj, <coughs> the famous mystic of uh, Islam and a might, uh, has been a symbol for many mystics who seek God. The Gubet of Halaj was part of the initiation rite of the Bektashis, and it was frequently referenced by the poets of the Janissary army. A famous Janissary poet, Kul Mustafa, uh, who fought in the army of Sultan Murat, shows in his poem that the Gulbank, or Bektashi prayers, uh, provided important moral support for the Janissaries when they charged <coughs> at their enemies. Um, uh, Janissary Bektashi poets became a more important part of urban culture in the Ottoman capital in the 17th century. Their poems were put to music and performed by poets themselves, accompanied by traditional string instruments such as sans or chukru, uh, in many me venues from coffee houses, taverns, millet drinking places, to the lodges of religious sects, mansions of the rich, and open spaces such as promenade spots uh, and outdoor festivals. 
Naima's description of eight of these Janissary poets reflects how glorious they were in the public's eye. He writes that eight Janissary poets walked in front of the Grand Vizier Ibshir Pasha and Mufti Ebu Said Efendi uh, wearing keche, a uh, type of uh, felt hat, on their heads and tiger skins on their backs. He, they walked by the imperial palace playing their chokers uh, and singing songs with lofty voices. Naima describes them as tall and strong, giant-like men whose song could be heard from a great distance. Urban spaces such as coffee houses, taverns, uh, millet drinking places uh, were more than entertainment places. Uh, trying the, uh, they were playing the uh, role of intersection points where news on the politics of the palace and campaigns was disseminated and oppositional voices were raised. The Janissaries not only frequented these spaces but opened their own coffee houses from the 17th century onwards, some having opening ceremonies with the presence of a Bektashi sheikh. This integration of the Janissaries with the Istanbulites deepened economically, uh, socially, and politically throughout the 18th and early 19th century. Uh, on the other hand, when we look at the relationship uh, with the uh, Janissary regiments and the Bektashi lodges, uh, this is a, a field that is not very well known. Um, however, it seems that uh, they the Janissary regiments and the Bektashi lodges uh, became more closely connected in the 16th century when Bayezid II brought Balum Sultan from Dimetoka to Kırşehir in order to reorganize and centralize the uh, Haji Bektash Veli Lodge in the empire. Uh, it's known that Janissaries and Ajemi Olans participated in the celebrations at the Said Gazi Tube every year and provided protection the head of the 94th Regiment of the Janissary Army where the Bektashi dervishes reside uh, was appointed by the Bektashi Sheikh in Kırşehir, who was also present at the ceremony that the dervish became a member of the uh, Janissary Army. Also, a document I found in the archives from 1702 shows that the appointment of the Haji Bektash Veli Lodge in Kırşehir was made at the request of the Janissary A, which indicates uh, a strong institutional connection. Um, the Bektashi lodges in Istanbul, on the other hand, mostly trace their origins uh, to the conquest of the city. Most of them have an oral tradition that speaks of an Abdal or Eran who was present during the conquest and became the sheikh of that particular lodge. However, the exact date of their foundation is generally unknown. Uh, it's probable that some of the old Bektashi lodges in Istanbul were established during or after the reign of Bayezid II, the period which the Bektashis institutionalized the sect in Istanbul, uh, actually uh, similar to others uh, such as the Halveti, Bayrami, and Nakshibandi orders. Uh, among the old Bektashi lodges in Istanbul uh, are the Mehmet Baba Lodge around the Yedikule Gate, Kara uh, Ağaç in Sütlice Kasım Paşa, the Şehitlik Lodge in Rumeli Hisarı, Şah Kulu in Merdivenköy Üsküdar, and Yarımca Baba, Baba uh, Lodge uh, in Paşa Limanı, Karyadı Baba Lodge in Eyüp. The relatively newer lodges in Istanbul were the Kunji Baba, that was founded in 1803, uh, it's a and uh, Tahir Baba lodges, also that is founded in 1798, uh, and they were both in Üsküdar. It is uh, noteworthy that these lodges were uh, typically located outside the city mm. center, and some of them were strategically positioned. Yerimce Baba and Şehitlik Lodges controlled the entrance of Bosphorus, and Mehmet Baba Lodge was close to uh, Yidikule Fortress, where there was a significant number of Janissaries. Uh, examining the depth of uh, the relationship uh, between the lodges and the Janissaries in Istanbul is challenging because very few documents have survived. For example, with some of these lodges, uh, are, uh, 
while, while some of these lodges are known to have existed as we read them in Evliya Çelebi's writings, official documents only mention them at the time of their closure and destruction in 1826 or soon before, uh, such as uh, Yerim, Yerimce Baba uh, Lodge, uh, we have this uh, lack of evidence. Um, with the abolition of the Janissary Army, the majority of these lodges are closed, uh, and some of uh, the Shays were sent to exile. I won't go into detail, probably DJ will talk about that. Uh, but I'd like to finish with uh, one example, uh, the connection between the Janissaries and Bektashis, as well as between the regiments and lodges, was far more vibrant than what uh, the destroyed Ottoman state archives or the demolished lodges reveal. This vibrant network is clearly evident in a document related to a Janissary plot discovered four months after the abolition of the Janissary army by the government this document was initially published by Ismail Hak Uzunçarşılı and was later thoroughly elaborated upon by Mersunar in an article. The document consists uh, of interrogation records of 29 individuals who were arrested and interrogated for plotting against the government. Among these, eight were Asakiri Mansuriye soldiers, six were Kalyoncus, nine were former Janissaries and uh, some civilians. The rumors of the rebellion were initiated by a former Janissary and Bektashi dervish named Ahmed, who owned a pipe bowl shop, so typically an artisan. Uh, another person involved uh, was Ahmed's Bektashi Sheikh, Mehmet Efendi, who managed to secretly remain in Istanbul after the abolition. Uh, he revealed a prophecy that 12,000 Bektashis armed with halberds would arrive uh, in Isküdar from Mecca and gather in the Mid Square, the famous uh, square at the Janissary Barracks where the famous rebellions usually began. Uh, and these rumors spread through several social networks. For example, soldiers in the uh, Asakiri Mansuri army who were from the same town and neighborhood, the Bektashi dervishes, and another network con uh, consisted of the members of the 75th uh, Regiment of the former Janissary Army, one of them being Mehmet Bayraktar, who ran a coffee house in Üsküdar. Mm -hmm. The discovery of the rebellion uh, plan resulted in another round of uh, manhunt for Janissaries and Bektashis in Istanbul, leading to many deaths uh, and the expulsion of 800 individuals from the city. So in conclusion, this invaluable interrogation record of the plot strongly confirms the deep historical connections that were established among the Janissaries and Bektashis, regiments, lodges, and coffee houses in Istanbul. And it also suggests uh, that the reason for the silence of Bektashi communities extended uh, beyond the destroyed archives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gulai, for shedding light in this so, so complicated issue. And I'll give the floor to uh, Mr. Jem Kara, who will go a step further in history and will talk about uh, the dismantlement of the Bektashi uh, networks in Turkey. Thank you very much, Jem. Uh, let me open the presentation. Um, Many thanks, uh, Evangelos, um, for the introduction, and to Yorios and Zeynep Project for organizing this interesting, fascinating uh, symposium and for inviting me. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, a topic that was part of my doctoral thesis, so it's been some years I've engaged with this. Um, however, I'm very much looking forward to revisiting this topic and this cutting it with you. Following on directly um, from Gulaoja's presentation, I would like to outline the history of the Bekdashi order after 1826, the year in which the Bekdashi order was officially banned by the Ottoman state. Given the short time available, I can only sketch the broad outlines of the development in order to 
um, yeah, mm -hmm. reconstruct larger processes. The paper is divided into two main parts. First, I will discuss the state's policy towards the Bekdashis from 1826 to the end of the Tanzimat. Secondly, I will look at the impact of this policy on the Bekdashis and in particular on their religious self-understanding. In 1826, in a bloody event, Sultan Mahmud II had the elite corps of Janissaries liquidated for opposing the planned military reform of the empire. Despite the violence, this event has been described in Ottoman historiography as an auspicious incident, Vakaya Hayriya. In the course of this abolition, the Bekdashi order was also prohibited. Different researchers have speculated about the Ottoman Empire's potable, uh, possible motives for abolishing uh, the Bekdashi order along with the Janissaries, ranging from the connection to the Janissaries to economic and religious motives. Regardless of the actual intentions of the state, the Ottoman state argued in religious categories in its official documents. In various sultan degrees, the Bekdashis were accused in particular of disregarding the Sharia and of their allegedly extreme alit views. Accordingly, the Bekdashis had distanced themselves from the name giver of their order, Haj Bekdashvili, whom the Ottoman state always honored in its decrees. The pro-state chronicler Esat Defender also cited religious arguments in his justifying chronicle of the liquidation, the genocide, and the abolition of the Bekdashis. Accordingly, the Janissaries were, I quote, the enemy of the state and the Bekdashis, the enemy of religion. Birisi düşmeni devlet, birisi düşmeni din. Thus, after 1826, at the ban of 1826, the Ottoman state actively spread peorative narratives about the Bekdashis. In this endeavor, the state was supported by ulema authors who used religious polemics against the Bekdashi as an important medium to spread polarizing and repulsive narratives about the Bekdashis. Although disparaging ideas about the Bekdashi had a long tradition, they became harsher in tone and content after 1826 and significantly shaped the discourse about the Bekdashi than the Ottoman Empire of the 19th century. Content-wise, these Pirative narratives about the Bekdashis can be divided into three categories. First, Bekdashis were discredited on a religious level as heretics who had abandoned Sunnah and Sharia in favor of extreme alit views. Secondly, this alleged inability to follow religious commandments would lead to moral misconducts culminating in accusations of sexual divines. These kinds of defamation are also known from other regions and the discrimination against religious minority in order to cause the greatest possible aversion of the vilified group. Ultimately, these accusations led to the view that the Bekdashis were a danger to society and state and that they contributed to the decline of the empire. So the state had to take harsh measures against them. The Bekdashis faced various discriminations on religious, moral, and political level, which were meant to explicitly exclude them from the circle of accepted religions in the Ottoman Empire. Despite some changes throughout the 19th century, the accusations were quite long-lasting and constant. However, discrimination was only the first step that led to a disciplinary approach. In 1826, the Ottoman state did not leave it at discrimination, but initiated various measures of religious disciplining. The original plans to destroy the Bekdashi takers were abandoned, also on the recommendation of the Shahid Islam. Instead, the aim was to transform the Bekdashi into true Sunni Muslims. Thus, after the ban, leading Bekdashis were exiled to places where the ulema were particularly influential. Moreover, takers were handed over to Sharia and Sunnah compliant Sufi orders, just such as the Naqshbandiya, to instruct Bekdashis in Sunni Islam. The open goal was to, I quote, to dissolve the malevolence of Bekdashism completely within Sunni Islam, end of quote. Accordingly, the state handed over the main Tekken Haji Bekdash 
and other tekkes through the next 20 years, such as the traditional Abd al Musa teke in El Mule and various tekkes in Istanbul. Other Sufi orders also benefited from the ban on the Bekdashi order. The Rifa'iyya took over the Bekdashi teke in Trikala, the Kaderi in Gelebolo and Skopje, Mevlevi uh, in Reni, the Bayramiya in Ankara, and the Halvetia in uh, Thessaloniki. However, it was mainly the Nakshibendiya who were charged with the religious instruction and disciplining of the Bekdashis. The transfer of the Bekdashi tekes to other Sufi orders or other measures taken by the state were not equally consistent throughout uh, the empire. While the Ottoman state was largely able to implement the decrees in Istanbul and surrounding regions, the implementation in peripheral regions was much less consistent. The, although we do not have much information, it seems that in the peripheral regions, persecution could not be pursued with the same vehemence because yeah, the reach of the state was limited there. Nevertheless, the period from 1826 to 1839 was probably the period in the history of the Bekdashis when they suffered most from discrimination and religious disciplinary measures. And this would not change until the reform era of the Tanzimat. The Tanzimat's generally more open religious policy also allowed the Bekdashi to rehabilitate their Sufi order to some extent. Some of their tekes were reactivated and returned to the Bekdashis, not de jure, but de facto. Thus, the larger tekes in Istanbul, also the main tekes in Haji Bektash, were again unofficially and practically run by Bekdashis. Officially, however, they were run as institution of the Sufi orders to which the tekes had previously been handed over. So in most of the cases as uh, tekes of the Nakshwendiya. During the Tanzimat, the Bekdashis also took advantage of the improved publication opportunities and published works that they attributed to their religious tradition. As a result, they regained visibility. The transmission of Bekdashi tickets to other Sufi orders also intensified the exchange between Bekdashis and other Sufi orders. Thus, there's much evidence from the Tanzimat era of cultural exchange between Bekdashis and other Sufi orders. For instance, there were numerous interactions with Sufi orders uh, with Bekdashis being recorded as joining the Nakshbendis, Mevlevis, Melamis, Rifais, or vice versa. In particular, contexts and exchanges with the Rifais can be reconstructed for the mid 19th century. A proverb dating to the period after 1826 states that the Bekdashi touch, meaning the Bekdashi um, head, uh, cap, is hidden under a Rifai touch alluding to a secret attachment to the Bekdashi un, under the guise of the Rifaiya. The saying suggests that many Rifais were secretly Bekdashi, and in some cases can be proven. For example, we know that some Rifai sheikhs tried to introduce some Bekdashi doctrines into the Rifai order, and how this provoked harsh reactions from the religious followers of the Rifais. And uh, the exchange between Rifai and Bekdashi would even lead to the amalgamation of the, tradition of, uh, of the two traditions into a Sufi subgroup called Marifia. And this subgroup crystallized in the mid 19th century in the Aegean region, combining the liturgy, ritual dress, and practices of the Rifai and Bekdashis. They established a small network of tekes in the Aegean region and also in Istanbul. However, it was precisely this increasing networking of the Bekdashis with other Sufi orders, their partial visibility through reactivated tekes and publication that provoked strong reactions from the ulema critical of the Bekdashis, leading to a new wave of polemics. In this context, the polemic of Harputli Issa Koja is particularly noteworthy, whose aggressiveness, radicalism, and defamation overshadowed all other polemics. At the same time, this polemic had a wide reach so that the aforementioned narrative narratives remained virulent. So in general, the Tanzimat period can be interpreted as an ambivalent phase in which, on the one hand, the big Dashis were able to reactivate their tekkers and publish some texts of their religious tradition. On the other hand, there was further, albeit less severe, religiously legitimized discrimination by the state and the ban was not lifted, but remained in force. More, open, more importantly, however, was that this period of rehabilitation led to an increase in attacks 
uh, the, uh, against the Bigdashis by ulema authors. Particularly in the final phase of the Tanzimat, ulema authors published fierce polemics against the Bigdashis, taking the mentioned peyorative narratives to the extreme. When the state became less vehement against the Bekdashis than it had been in previous decades, the Bekdashi critical ulema maintained and sometimes even intensified the peorative discourse about the Bekdashis. To put, it, to put it simple, what the state lost in vehemence was maintained by the ulema. So coming to my uh, second part of the paper, so what was the reaction of the Bekdashis uh, to this policy of discrimination and disciplining? And dealing with this, determined the history of the Bekdashi order in this period hardly like any other topic did. Among many, among many problems and conflicts, it led to various processes of religious negotiation within the Bekdashi order. These negotiation processes began during the Tanzimat, but continued into the Young Turk period up to the establishment of the Republic. While some Bekdashis further reinforce the difference to Sunni interpretations of Islam and distance themselves further from them by emphasizing non-conformist and antinomian ideas, others sought an approach to Sunni Hanafi Islam. They argued, in turn, that the Bektashi was in conformity with Sunni interpretations of Islam and thus part of the Ehli Sunnah. In this context, publications are an important key to reconstructing the performative negotiation processes. The first writings that can be proven to have been published by Bekdashis date back to the early Tanzimat. Bekdashis took advantage of the less strict policies of the Tanzimat to publish several religious works and anthologies of poets they considered to be part of their tradition. What is striking about these publications during the early Tanzimat is that they are predominantly works that clearly do not conform to Sunni interpretations of Islam and reinforce religious boundaries with Sunnism. Either works with a clear and distinct alid, sometimes even Shi'it tendency, or works in the Hurufi tradition. In particular, works with Hurufi, con Hurufi content uh, were suspected of heresy during this period, which makes the publication of a relatively large number of works from this tradition by Bekdash is quite revealing. One could go so far as to say that the first works published were primarily those that drew the strongest line of demarcation to Sunnism. Thus, until the end of the 1860s, a non-conformist tendency dominated the performative actions of the Bekdashis, emphasizing in particular the dissociation from Sunni interpretations of Islam. These very publications then triggered another wave of polemics in the 1870s. As mentioned before, from the 1870s onwards, polemics against the Bekdashis became more vehement and widespread. The polemic of Isaac Koja played a major role in this. In response to, yeah, in response to these accusations, a more conformist approach prevailed, which actively and clearly sought a closeness to Sunnism. For example, different agents wrote direct responses to the polemics and attempted to refute the accusations made there. In doing so, the authors took a multi-dimensional multi approach. Firstly, they emphasized that the commandments and prohibitions of the Sharia also apply to Bekdashis and actively discredited those Bekdashis who would break these rules. Secondly, they incorporated teachings that can be read as Sunni as part of the Bektashia in order to present it as a Sunnah compliant Sufi order. The most conspicuous um, of these are attempts to trace the Silsile tradition of the Bektashia through Abu Bakr rather than Imam Ali. As you all know, Silsiles are chains of traditions uh, traced back through generations of student teacher relations. Uh, to go going all the way back to the uh, Prophet Muhammad, and that's a central means of religious authority. In most Sufi orders in the Ottoman Empire, even those that consider themselves decidedly as Sunni, this lineage ran through Imam Ali. The fact that the Bekta Shia as an Ali denomination used Abu Bakr as a starting point of its religious legitimacy seems almost overcompensating and made it even more Sunni than other Sufi orders. 
Thirdly, they deliberately omitted issues and practices that could potentially cause conflict or emphasize differences with Sunnism, such as the 1826 ban or ritual practices of the Bekdashi order, such as the Maidan or Sofra, which could be considered as not conforming to Sunni interpretations. All this indicates that some Bekdashis took the comparatively politically more favorable phase during the Tanzimat as an opportunity to publish rather non-conformist teachings. The fierce reaction of Sunni critics, most notably Isa Kojas, may then have largely pushed back the non-conformist approach and performative activities. Conversely, the re-emergence of polemics induced conformist Bekdashis to pursue performative closeness to Sunni Islam. The observations so far have mainly referred to performative approaches, mostly by intellectual and higher representatives of uh, the Bekdashis, with such performative approaches aimed at a larger, primarily Sunni audience, there's of course always the question of intention, uh, which in this case was clearly an attempt at rehabilitation. This is why some scholars, such as Birch, have described this pro-Sunni pro approach as a takia strategy to rehabilitate the Bekdashia. By takia, these authors um, mean the faint denial of one's actual religious affiliation and the apparent adoption of the discourse determining in order to um, yeah, um, um, escape persecution while secretly remaining to um, the original belief. And indeed the general argumentation, I mean the general argumentation cannot be dismissed out of hand. One indication of this is that some agents who publicly appear to be particularly pro-Sunni and demonized the Hurufiya, wrote privately poetry entirely in the Hurufi tradition. In general, such non-conformist approaches can be found in non-performative, close contexts, for instance, in private notebooks throughout the 19th century. However, the attempts of many Bekdashis to establish a Sharia and Sunnah-compliant Bekdashi interpretation should not be reduced exclusively to political calculation as many Bekdashi had apparently internalized these ideas. And this internalization processes have resulted also from the mentioned cultural contexts and exchanges with other Sufi orders. This brings me to the end of my presentation, my conclusion. Um, after the ban of 1826, the Ottoman state pursued a double strategy of discrimination and disciplining. On the one hand, in coalition with the Lema authors, Bekdashis were discriminated against as a religiously heretical, morally corrupt, and sociopolitically dangerous group and excluded from the circle of accepted religions. However, the state did not stop at discrimination but introduced various measures of religious disciplining towards Sunnitization. A central measure in this context was the transfer of Bekdashi tekes to Sharia and Sunnah compliant Sufi orders. While this dual strategy was not applied or enforced with the same rigor as throughout the empire, it was a constant feature of state policy towards the Bekdashis until the Tanzimat. During the Tanzimat, however, there was a limited rehabilitation in which the Bekdashi reactivated their tekes, at least unofficially. In addition, the Bekdashis took advantage of the Tanzimat's less restrictive <coughs> policy uh, to publish works on their belief. This new find visibility then unleashed a new wave of religious polemics, even harsher in tone and content than those after 1826. In phases, and this can basically be observed until the beginning of the 20th century, when the state policy became comparatively a bit more less restrictive, the attacks of the ulema increased, so that the peorative discourse about the Bekdashis remained relatively constant. The Bekdashis responded on this combination of discrimination and disciplining in different ways. As a result, religious negotiation took place in which the Bekdashis oscillated between rapprochement with Sunni Islam and demarcation. <coughs> of course, it's not surprising that in a religious group as socially and regionally diverse as the Bekdashir, they are also different religious uh, positions. And the same applies to representatives of Sunni Islam who, of course, were not mono monolithically opposed to the Bekdashis. Even there are very, very few openly addressed voices that spoke <coughs> out in favor of the Bekdashis, 
we know that often the direct interaction was less conflictual. All observations can therefore only be made with the reservation of the ideal type in which certain aspects are emphasized in order to recognize larger developments. My attempt was therefore, uh, has therefore been to identify ideal, ideal typical tendencies mainly in performative actions and how they have transformed with changing um, political and discursive settings. And it seems that the Bekdashi's first reaction to post-ban discrimination was to draw even stronger boundaries by spreading rather non-conformist ideas. The strong reaction of the ulema critics may have largely pushed back the non-conformist approach and performative effectivity. Conversely, the re-emergence of polemics induced the performative proximity to Sunni Islam. So, and this oscillation between conformity and non-conformity determined the history of the Big Dashi order also for the next decades. Uh, yeah, with that, I'm at the end of my presentation and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jem, for uh, all this valuable insight and uh, especially this oscillation between conformity and non-conformity, which is uh, probably one of the most fascinating aspects of uh, Bektashism. Uh, and I'll give the floor to uh, Mrs. Zeynep Turkilmaz, who will uh, talk about this uh, complicated period of uh, the uh, Abdul Hamid II, the Hamidian period, and how the Bektashi Alevi communities uh, managed to cope with this period. Thank you very much, Zeynep. So, um, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Vangeli, for taking care of all of this. Um, as one of the organi organizers and, I guess, um, uh, gang members, I would like to, first of all, welcome all of you here, uh, participants, for coming and being with us, sharing their uh, research, and the, um, also our guest for uh, staying the second day after a very full um, first day. I feel very happy to be particularly on this panel with you know such wonderful papers. Um, so what I'll try to do today is actually um, I want a, I will uh, try to discuss three cases um, I have gathered documents about over the years. I work on some of them in more detail. Some of them are still at the very prelim prelim preliminary stage, but I would like to provide an overview of the. Bektashi Alevi uh, lives, uh, especially those who are challenging the more mainstream or uh, orthopraxic, um, pra orthopraxy, even uh, within the Alevi Bektashi communities um, in the 90, in the late 19th century, in the uh, Hamidian period. Uh, so these three communities are. I'll first start with. Uh, I, I hope I'm doing the first or the right one. Um, so. Um, Mehmet Tevfik Baba in Kırklareli, um, who was based in uh, Tekke Şehler um, and um, was an initiated Bektashi Baba. The second group I'm going to talk about is going to be from Tokat Zile, uh, Anşa Bacılılar, um, who again um, was seen in the Ottoman, very heavily in the Ottoman documents, uh, on the Ottoman, among the Ottoman documents. Uh, in 1880s, the second half of 1880s. And finally, um, I'll talk about uh, Arabolu Tekkesi, or those are pejoratively known as Prots, um, around Sivas Kangal, again, uh, the same period. So actually, uh, historian, Ottoman historians particularly like talking about the Hamidian period. Um, it reflects some of the ills, actually, of the our you know, Ottoman historians, because Ottoman historians really like uh, talking about the states, really talking about state centers, the capitals, uh, big cities, urban life. Um, and they also like to talk about, you know, powerful sultans period. So actually, Abdul Hamid's period takes all these um, fantasies about the Ottoman Empire. Uh, whereas, um, you know, um, I'll also talk about Hamidian period, for, for a different reason, actually. Um, maybe, you know, outcomes of these uh, features I've just mentioned. Um, 
uh, Abdul Hamid's period was, uh, Abdul Hamid II's period was quite interesting um, uh, for researchers because it li leaves a lot of documentation. So for any community you are looking into, uh, there are a number of uh, documents you can find um, from informants, which I'll talk in more detail, from the Ottoman officials talking about these groups. So it, it in a way uh, makes it um, very convenient for historians to research on these uh, even you know, muted or communities that excelled in hiding themselves from the um, reach of the state. The second one is obviously um, Hamidian period is perhaps not a period of flourishing or um, you know, rebuilding themselves for the Kızılbaş Alevi communities, but one of uh, surveillance. So this surveillance again um, tells us a lot about the uh, strategies that, were, that was developed by the Ottoman state and organized and better informed strategy to suppress these communities, which I argue actually were quite vibrant in the period that actually uh, Jem was just talking about. So a Abdul Hamid period marks in a way um, more of a survival strategy for the communities that I'll talk about and not necessarily uh, flourishing. So first I will start with um, Mehmet Tefik Baba, um, who actually came, who was the son of a Nakshi uh, Bandi um, father, uh, who came, um, whose family came from uh, Crimea. Um, and uh, his father got the, um, the property uh, where, uh, you know, uh, these Aras Baba and Akamber Baba Tekkes uh, existing, existed. Um, and um, basically, um, um, he lost his father, Tefik Baba lost his father when he was nine and inherited this land with the, you know, already existing tekkes on his land at the age of nine. Uh, so later in his life, he was initiated as a Bektashi Baba with connections to um, Rumel Hisarı uh, um, uh, Tekke and, um, and became um, a well-known um, Bektashi Baba, uh, who was known as the Sheikh of um, uh, Aras, uh, Aras Baba. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the first documents, at least I can locate about uh, Tefik Baba, uh, comes as an um, kind of a discontent, kind of an informant compl complaining about Tefik Baba's seditious activities um, in, in the uh, late 1880s, although we know that in from his interrogation, actually, um, his activities dates um, earlier than 1880s. Um, and this, in this uh, brief inter interrogation record that you again find in the uh, Ottoman archives, um, uh, Te Mehmet Tefik Baba uh, denied, accepted that actually there are tekkes, existing sh uh, shrines, spectacle shrines on his land. And uh, as the owner of these land, he's providing um, uh, food and um, room f for the visitors of these uh, shrines. He himself is an initiated Bektashi, but he's not um, a leader of any kind of movement. He doesn't, you know, uh, uh, he doesn't run any uh, Ayini gem. Um, he was basically simply um, an ordinary uh, Bektashi, uh, you know, initiated Bektashi that basically provides um, food and, um, uh, you know, uh, hospitality because he basically, he's the pro property owner. And he's called, he claimed that he's called the uh, Sheikh of Aras Baba because of this property relation and not because of any of the activities um, uh, he's um, engaging in. Um, and um, also while he was mentioning, you know, when he was responding to the, you know, interrogators uh, questions, very detailed questions about his activities, again, he denied, as I said, you know, any kind of uh, seditious activity, but he said the visitors of the shrine included, you know, the notables from, in the environs of the Kırklareli Edirne, but also state officials such as, you know, Ze Zevat uh, um, Kiram, prominent figures, figures of the state, like the deceased Muhlis Pasha, judge of Edirne Ruhi Bey, or the secretary chief Ali Bey. So he de definitely mentions these big names as the, you know, uh, regular followers of uh, the Tekke. So um, unfortunately, his uh, interrogation did not help. 
his case, and then the decision was already taken that he should be exiled to Tripoli in 1883, um, and uh, six, six years later, he died in Tripoli in exile. And, um, and I will leave the story here, but um, we'll come back to that later on. Uh, the second group I'll talk about is a quite interesting story because it's one of those rare cases even for now. We mostly talk about Babas, we mostly talk about Dedes, but we hardly talk about Anas, right? The role of women um, in the Bektashi Alibi communities. And Anşe Bacılılar, or Ayş, uh, that are still known as, um, I, I, her name is Ayş, Ayşe Bacı, but is uh, locally known as Anşe Bacılılar. Uh, were a group that was gathered around a female figure who, according to the Ottoman, of, uh, you know, again, Ottoman documentation, who claimed, who made a claim to deity, so claimed to be a god or having performed the features of god. And obviously that comes with a very pejorative language um, in, the, uh, in the documentation, but um, the story of um, Anşe Bacılar is quite interesting and goes back to, again, uh, 1826 and the separation and the policies of the state that came after that. And obviously, um, um, not, you know, there was this, this dynamic that uh, Jam just uh, mentioned between conformism, oscillation between conformism and nonconformism. Um, and Ayşe Bacı's uh, deceased husband, Veli Baba, took the side of uh, nonconformity and quite angry with uh, his fellow um, Beydilli Saraj, who some of whom actually uh, decided to go for a, a more uh, conformist approach and uh, broke away from them and uh, formed their um, own uh, rituals and, uh, and um, order um, around Veli Baba. But Veli Baba died uh, fairly early, leaving Ayşe Bacı with three sons and two daughters. This will all become very le re relevant um, very soon. So according to interrogation uh, record again, and the reports uh, submitted uh, from the provinces uh, to the, uh, the state, uh, Ayşe Bacı and you know, these Sırachlar were quiet for a, a, a you know, brief, brief time after Veli Baba's death, but then they began to organize around um, Ayşe Bacı, who again, made a claim that his last son, Hassan, was born two, two years after the death of uh, her husband. So again, this myth about promiscuity, right, um, of the, especially the Kızılbaş woman, suggesting that, you know, she was engaging in extra marital affair after the death of her husband. To cover up, according to the Ottoman officials, uh, this kind of promiscuous behavior, she came up with the lie that her little, the, the youngest son, is actually Mehdi. So was born, obviously, after her husband um, mm. for that particular mm. reason. And um, er, around the 1880s, um, she began to uh, send her all three sons and one of the son-in-laws as the um, representatives of uh, her order. Uh, according to these documents, again, they were collecting doc uh, donations um, and then they were forcing people to come under the um, felt cap uh, and give their uh, submission and obedience to Anşe Bacılı and they were, if they do not, uh, they were threatened with harsh um, punishment. Uh, again, uh, the scare that, was, that which comes very um, strongly in, those, uh, in this documentation is that these um, Anşe Bacınılar were uh, expanding in numbers and, and their influence went beyond uh, Tokat and, uh, and approaching to different parts of um, Sivas where a significant uh, Kızılbaş population already existed. And these uh, Ayşe Bacılılar were armed and might be actually plotting an uprising against um, the Ottoman state and perhaps first against their um, Sunni neighbors. Uh, Ayşe Bacı and uh, her, uh, her entire family was brought to the interrogation room. Uh, they were questioned about their beliefs, about the claims made by the local uh, Sunni communities. Um, and very much like um, Mehmet uh, Tevfik Baba, uh, 
she and her sons and son-in-law all denied all the charges about running, uh, I in a gym, or holding ceremonies, uh, gathering donations, or carrying any kind of um, uh, religious activity except being, you know, um, a good believer. And she also denied the charge that uh, her son was born after the death of, of, of her, her husband. And, and she actually took a step further and not only she denied carrying any of this activity or, you know, claiming any, you know, um, uh, arguing that she's not leader of any sort, she actually claimed that um, she herself is um, from um, the Hanifi, the followers of Imam Azam uh, and, uh, and the followers of Abu Hanifi. So denied any kind of Kızılbaş or um, uh, Alevi or Bektashi, um, attachment. Uh, however, this didn't really do any good to her. Again, it was. It seemed like there was already a commitment to send her to exile as well. Uh, Ayşe Bacı, together with her uh, son Hassan Hussein Ali and um, his son-in-law Ibrahim, was this time sent to Damascus, uh, where he, where she spent uh, almost a year, um, sending an Arzuhal a petition saying that basically. Uh, all these neighbors are, you know, uh, is committing uh, libel and slanders. We are not Ali. We are not followers of Ali. We are followers of um, Abu Hanifi, uh, and we are not engaged in, in any kind of seditious activity. Please send us back. I mean, that is a, a usual activity. But what is quite interesting is, is also a petition in Arzihal um, submitted from um, Kasım Pasha uh, by the dockyard workers uh, who were of coming from at least, you know, significant, significant part of them were coming from um, Tokat, which was confirmed by the local muhtar uh, and the imam. And they submitted a petition for the release of uh, Ansha Baje from the exile. Um, quite interestingly, uh, there were back and forth also among the Ottoman officials. Some of them said this document ac itself actually proves that Ansha Baje's influence is going beyond Tokat, so that should be, you know, they're, they should be very careful, but the governor of Sivas, quite interestingly, wrote a very endearing, actually, um, uh, report about um, Anshe Baji and said, basically, she's a helpless woman, doesn't have a capacity to you know, seduce anyone or could plot any kind of rebellion, and these are sade dil kızılbaş. These are people of coming from naive kızılbaş background, so they should be coming back, and they did. Um, I think like a year in, in Damascus. The final, um, the final community I will briefly talk about is Arabolu Tekkesi. It comes from Sivas Kangal, where actually where, where my very close to where my parents are from, and I also heard uh, the name brought from my family, um, not in a very endearing way. I have to admit uh, there were all kinds of rumors about the practices of these prod communities, and I was quite puzzled about you know what who prod the term prod uh, entailed itself. Um, and later on, um, in the um, missionary archives, I came across um, with this document about uh, Kızılbaş Kurds who were in uh, interaction with the local um, missionaries local American missionaries and were asking their help in, um, in terms of uh, educating um, their community and lear learning more about their religion. Um, and this is actually the one on the left comes from the missionary archives and the notebook of um, um, Henry Perry, one of the missionaries, who didn't ho hold very high well, you know, views about this community. He didn't really trust um, you know, Kızılbaş or other, um, or Muslim communities um, uh, in Sivas. He, did, he wasn't very happy missionary in Sivas for his own personal history, but he visited all these villages uh, where the Arab Tekke um, held grounds and uh, listed their activities um, in his notebooks. Arab Tekke seems to come from Dersim. Again, uh, the split was the experience of, again about as an after aftershocks of 1826 uh, split, um, and had to do with uh, how the ritual should be carried out, and particularly about use of tariq or not, uh, this religious, um, I don't want to say stick, but tariq. 
Tarık, yeah, um, the use of Tarık in, um, in the Ayni Cem, uh, they broke away. Uh, but this breaking away was not as simply breaking away with the use of Tarık, but went beyond that. They refused the hierarchy of the Dedes, they refused the Ocak structure, and they began to actually, again, this is, this is an information that comes through mostly through uh, missionaries who were sometimes favorable and sometimes not so favorable uh, to these communities, but they began to think about their own tradition vis-a-vis -vis these new ideas about religiosity that came with the American missionaries. Uh, so one of the things that they told quite uh, often, like what Zeynep mentioned yesterday, about the similarities between Jesus and Ali, and then they also started talking about, you know, uh, the uh, Lokma um, and the mess and the sharing of the sacred wood, blessing of the food. Uh, but more interesting, I guess, and more particularly in this group, which makes it very interesting for me, is that their uh, use of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, concept, the, the city of um, consent, that is obviously has a very, very long history in the Alevi Bektashi tradition, and they resembled it to the early Christians uh, where there was no private property. And they said, uh, we are, uh, we should re, um, rekindle this kind of lifestyle, uh, and um, this kind of lifestyle, and they actually denied private property. Um, up until 1960s, they refused to have separations in within their villages in terms of their lands. So it all turned into communal property and refused the dedes and um, orders. So, um, um, so what does it tell us about the Ottoman state? I think I'm really running out of time. Um, so I'll, I'll um, briefly make a few points. First of all, all these stories tell us that in this period, we see um, in a consolidation of an ethno ethnographic state that wants to know about their Alevi Kızılbaş subject, not only about them, but since we are talking about Alevi Kızılbaş subjects, they, they want to know about the nonconformity in details. So all these reports, all these documents about I individual groups, always included details about how many people, from which village, villages, what are their names. And you can see, you know, these are from uh, different files of these Anshabacılılar, Tevfik Baba's followers. And so this ethnographic state was not lim 